The other thing that just killed me when I got into the group is the number of dogs that came into the group where they had been having UTIs or other symptoms for six months to a year, and they never diagnosed prostate cancer. And so when they got in there in our group, they only had like two or three months left. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Hello, friend. Thank you for joining us today as we talk to Renee Michael about her amazing Basset Hound, Roscoe, and his true tale of cancer, specifically prostate cancer. Roscoe is no longer with us, but his legacy is definitely living on and will well into the future, as you will understand as we speak to Renee. Renee, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm just thrilled to be able to talk to you in person. I've known you for a long time. You're a very active and supportive member of our Facebook group, Dog Cancer Support. And of course, you've given us many tasty little treats recipes for our readers and our listeners over the years. And I just am so pleased that you're here. You're a big part of our community. And I thank you for taking your time to be here today. Thank you again. So tell me about Roscoe. Tell me about his cancer diagnosis. Tell me about all the things, because I know it's a big story. So where do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. So he was a rescue, or I say he rescued me on Mother's Day in 2011. He was one of the healthiest dogs I've ever had. But like I said, I have this thing, I call it my mommy's spider sense when it comes to the dogs, because they're the only kids that I have. And my vet knows that if I tell her there's something wrong or I think there's something wrong, she knows she's going to check and make sure. So with Roscoe, there was something I didn't know what it was. Living 15 minutes from LSU, I can go there and say, can you do a full workup on my dog? Give me x-rays, give me ultrasounds, give me blood work. Because especially as he it's was- Louisiana State University. Oh, yes. Thank you. Louisiana State University. Yes. In Baton Rouge. And also he was about- 11 years old. And I started that with Thibodeau. If one of my dogs gets older and there's something that just seems off, I'll take them over there and have them do a full workup. That way, if there's something, they can find it. So I was thinking maybe, you know, maybe there was something with his liver, maybe his heart, something like that, because he had had a heart murmur. He had some liver problems early and they come back and say prostate cancer. And I was just like, I was in shock. What did you see? What were the symptoms that you saw? I didn't, he did not have any symptoms. He was just, I don't know what it was. He was just, he just wasn't himself. And I can't put a finger on it. Your spidey senses are so good that your dog wasn't actively acting as if he was sick, but you just knew something was wrong. Yes. And you went, got a full workup and they found prostate cancer. Correct. Wow. Yeah. Those are spidey senses. Yeah. And that's why I said, I can't, I can't point to any one thing that said it was, there was a problem, but it was just something to me that he just seemed a little off, not majorly off, right? But a little off. So I said, well, let's just take him in and get him checked. Can't hurt, right? Cost money, but it can't hurt. So that's when they found the prostate cancer. And I just kind of, you know, I lost it. That was at the end of February in 2020. Yeah. We got to see oncology the next week. They talked about radiation, chemo, that kind of stuff. But they said, before we discuss any of that, we need to do a CT scan to see if it's spread. Because if it has metastasized, then that would change the treatment options, right? So we went ahead and set up the CT scan, and that's about when COVID hit. So I was able to talk to them. I got a really good understanding of radiation because the two offerings of radiation were the definitive radiation, which she said was like 20 sessions over four weeks every day, which was like a lot because they have to put them under for each one. And the other one was what she called SRT, stereotactic radiation, I think is how you pronounce it. And she said that for him would just be three sessions, a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then he'd be done. So I said, let's do that. We'll do that. We'll get that over with. And then we'll think about what comes after radiation. But let's do that first. COVID hit. Everything started shutting down. He was scheduled for one week. They pushed it. He was scheduled for another week. I said, "Ah." we did one session of chemo because I was panicking, thinking, not knowing anything about it, thinking it was going to spread quickly, right? So we did one session of chemo, scheduled the radiation again. They started to push it again. I started writing letters to the governor and to the mayor and everybody else. (laughs) Because I said, you know, they got the hospitals open. 
this is life-saving to my dog. If you can save his life-saving for people, why can't it be life-saving for pets? So we got him in for his radiation. <laughs> they said he can come in. If he can't finish those three sessions of radiation, if we have to shut down, we won't be able to finish it, and it could cause problems. I said, I don't care. Let's do it. He got all three of them in. So he got his three sessions of radiation in. He did great. They sent us home with the appetite stimulant and um, diarrhea medicine because they said that could happen after that, and I had a bullion diet ready. So he was good. He flew through it. Dr. Looper said he flew through the radiation. He didn't have any problems with it, where apparently some dogs do have problems with it. So he didn't have any problems with it. I was, was prepared with the bland diet, so I knew to do that up front right. And he, like I said, they sent him some nausea medicine and some diarrhea medicine. He had a little bit of diarrhea, but he didn't have, really have any side effects from the radiation at all, which was fantastic. It didn't slow him down at all, which was fantastic. So we gave him a couple weeks of that, and then they said, okay, now we need to talk about chemo. And I am just not a big fan of chemo personally because of the, my background with stuff that has happened. So I said, mm, I need to talk to somebody about it. Well, with COVID, they were doing shifts, right? Some people would work and some people would stay home. So I got to talk to Dr. Luper, who's the head of oncology. And she told me personally, she wouldn't do it for her dog. So I said, well, that answers that question. And I went ahead with no chemo. So why did your oncologist think that doing chemo initially was not a good idea? Okay. Well, it, we caught it early and it hadn't spread. The reason that she's told me that is she said prostate cancer, most prostate cancers, okay, not all, but most prostate cancers, because there's two, there's the adenocarcinoma and there's the TCC. Mm -hmm. So I imagine she was talking about the TCC. Initiate in the prostate and the bladder, and they are very, very slow to spread. Ah. And when she said chemo, she's talking more about the systemic chemo, I think is the word she used. Mm -hmm. The one where it, it hits the whole body rather than right. targeted chemo. Yeah, yeah. So she said those don't work really good on the prostate cancer. So she said what she recommends is if you catch it early enough and you can do the CERT radiation, the stereotactic radiation, do that initially. And then you can wait until you or your oncologist or whatever feel comfortable with starting it. I didn't feel comfortable with starting it. So we never did chemo on Roscoe. Okay. Roscoe never got chemo. Roscoe got stereotactic radiation three times. Three times, correct. That was really the only thing that got, and then he was on meloxicam already because of his arthritis, because the other thing they want to do is they want to put him on NSAIDs, because NSAIDs are real key with prostate cancer. He was already on meloxicam, mm -hmm. so they said, well, we'll just leave him on that for now. Okay, so they didn't change the dose or anything. They just kept him on meloxicam. Correct. I think he was on the 50-pound dose, and they just kept him on that. So that's when I started doing all my research in foods and stuff, right? Because I said, there's got to be something that can help because I made all our own foods. And I, I got the dog cancer diet and I read through it and I was making his own food. So I said, well, that's really close to what I'm doing anyway. Mm -hmm. So I did that and I started changing some of it with the cruciferous vegetables and that kind of stuff. And then when you start looking, there are certain foods that help certain areas of the body. So like asparagus helps your kidneys. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's other things that help specifically with your kidneys, with your urinary tract, cranberries help with your urinary tract and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So I started doing research on all those different types of foods and I started adding them into his bowl. Because, you know, when you're making your own food, it's easy to just plop stuff in there, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's one of the good things about making your own food is that you're in control. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So he was doing really good. And then about, so that was in February. He, I think he had his radiation in April. We saw Dr. Hale for the first time at the end of April. The um, LSU has an integrative medicine department. Ah. And Dr. Hale is a TCM vet. TCBM vet. Sorry about that. Traditional Chinese veterinary medicine. So we met up with her and we started doing acupuncture for his arthritis and she put him on two different of the Chinese herbs for his prostate cancer. We kept going to her every month for his arthritis. You know, I talked to her a lot. I learned a lot from her. One of the other things that acupuncture does is it helps stimulate the immune system. Mm -hmm. And um, having a good immune system is key for cancer, right? Right. To help fight cancer. So when I was first starting to research my food, I was looking for antioxidants. And then it's like, well, wait a minute. With prostate cancer, 
one of the things that the meloxicam is, is anti-inflammatory. So I kind of switched instead of looking for antioxidants to look at anti-inflammatories. Uh-huh. So I just started loading up his bowl with a whole bunch of anti-inflammatories. <laughs> <laughs> he had a <laughs> poor guy. He was like, oh, really? <laughs> like what? Like what were you feeding him? Oh, oh boy. I mean, the berry, all the different kinds, the dark berries, right? Yeah. The cruciferous vegetables. Yes. The mushrooms, right? I yes. started hitting mushrooms there, and then I learned a lot more about the different kinds of mushrooms later. But, you know, what I did is you just start searching the internet for foods that are anti-inflammatory and then finding the ones that are safe for dogs because not everything you find is safe for dogs, right? That's right. That's why Dr. Dressler includes all of those in his dog cancer diet, that the cruciferous right. veggies, all the dark berries, exactly, the mushrooms, maitake and shiitake and all of the other delicious mushrooms. Those are all in his diet because they are anti-inflammatory and they help to support the body and fight cancer. Now, it doesn't do everything, but it helps, right? Right. That's exactly right. And it does. Roscoe was a testament to that. It does help. And then um, he got his first, because dogs with prostate cancer are prone to UTIs. Uh-huh. So he got his first UTI, urinary tract infection, in June, I think. We treated that with about a month of antibiotics. And then a little while after that, he got another one in August. So we mm. treated that one again, different antibiotics. That's one thing that's really key that LSU drummed into my head that a lot of people in our group, their doctors didn't do, is if your dog has a UTI, do a culture, wait on the culture, and do the antibiotics based on the culture. Mm. Because what they told me is, number one, if you don't do a culture and then just do antibiotics, you could be giving the wrong antibiotics, which could make the UTI worse and harder to treat. Mm -hmm. The other thing is some people were doing, um, what did they call them, kind of maintenance antibiotics. So they would just, yeah, they would just keep their dog on antibiotics. So I asked them about that with the second one, and they said, no, 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 because the same thing, right, is if you're given antibiotics for something that you may be giving them the wrong antibiotic, which means that whatever the bacteria is, is resistant to that antibiotic and could get worse. Right, get stronger. Exactly. It gets more practice fighting off that antibiotic. Giving routine, chronic, low-dose antibiotics is a super old, outdated idea, frankly. To my understanding, that's not something that medical professionals, human or veterinary, generally embrace anymore. Yeah. And I was surprised when they did that. So that, And that was a good thing with LSU and with COVID because I could email my oncologist and tell me I had a question and she'd answer. Yay. That's so nice. And they, they drilled into my head. You know, no, you cannot have antibiotics. You have to wait for the culture. I don't care if it's going to take seven days. You have to wait for the culture. You have to wait for the right antibiotics. So he had two UTIs, and he never had another one. Mm. So he went 21 months with only two UTIs early. That's unusual for prostate cancer in dogs. Yes, very unusual. So when again, when he got his UTIs, right, that's something else I started researching on. What helps the bladder the kidneys, that whole urinary tract, right? So I found those foods and I started dumping those in his bowl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor kid. <laughs> okay, so what are those foods? Oh, um, I've got them written down somewhere. I'd have to go and dig. They're definitely asparagus, cranberries, uh-huh. celery. Uh huh. He had two meals a day with his supplements. I added a third small lunch. And his <laughs> small lunch was pureed celery, pureed asparagus, and pureed cranberries. Oh, my goodness. Did you cook them? No, all raw. Oh, my goodness. And he ate that. There's a lot of people listening who are like, what? No dog would ever eat that, but he ate it. Oh, he loved it. He loved it. Because I. that's one of the things is when I was feeding him, right? Before he got sick, I, was, I had actually just, I started feeding him homemade diet about a year before he got sick, and I'd switched to raw about six months before. So with the raw diet, they would get the raw veggies along with the raw meat and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. When he was diagnosed with cancer, they said, we recommend not raw meat. And I said, why? And they said, because a healthy dog body can fight off the bacteria that's in raw meat because you cannot get rid of bacteria out of raw meat no matter what you try and do. There's going to be some. 
but a dog with cancer may not be able to. So I said, okay, that answers that. So I just, I started cooking their meat in a crock pot, slow and long, right? Mm -hmm. To try and keep as many nutrients in it as possible. But I guess maybe because of that, they love their raw veggies. That's awesome. And people think I'm nuts, but you know, their treats are broccoli and cauliflower and carrots and celery. You gotta put almond butter on the celery, on celery and stuff like that. They just love their raw apples, bananas. They love all the raw veggies. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah, they do. But it's healthy for them. People don't know that dogs like healthy foods. Right. And the neat thing about it is they munch all day long. They get treats like every two hours or whatever, and they're not overweight. Right. Because everything they eat is healthy. So that's a good thing. So, yeah, so that's the main things. I think the other thing is I started the snack water, right, which we had talked about, where I started giving them water. Because when you give them homemade food, they tend to stop drinking water because they get enough moisture out of their food. But I wasn't sure he was getting enough water. So I started making him snack water, which was water with some broth or some gravy or something in it so that he would drink it. And he would get about a cup of snack water a day. <laughs> We have a recipe for that on our site, and I'll make sure that we link to it. And I also want to make sure people know that they can get your book with these recipes. So we'll talk about that too. But Yeah, yeah. and I, um, I pulled the book off. Oh, that's right. Okay. It's a free PDF now. If you want that, I can send that to you, and you can figure out how to do something with that. Oh, that would be wonderful. So we'll include a link in the show notes to your free recipe book for Roscoe so that people can... Try these with their own dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Great. So I started doing the snack water. And I think when I, I did some research about a month or so ago, because people were having, or people, dogs were having UTIs again. So I said, well, this is what I did for Roscoe. So everybody's starting to try that now. You know, one of the things I want to try and do is help them not have UTIs because UTIs can be nasty. Oh, and they're so painful. Well, and if they don't get a hold of them, right, the bacteria can cause problems in the body. Absolutely. So I was lucky. Roscoe only had two UTIs. So he was doing really good. And then he started having some blood in his urine in October of 2020. Mm. So we took him in for a staging and they said everything was fine. You know, the prostate was still shrinking. It had started shrinking some after the um, the radiation. The prostate was still shrinking, but they said... It could be effect of the radiation causing the prostate to shed, mm. the tumor to shed some. So they started him on peroxicam. They moved him from meloxicam to peroxicam, which is a stronger NSAID. Mm -hmm. And then we also started him on, Dr. Hale started him on the YBY, and I'm not going to say this right, the Yanyan Bio. Uh, Yunin Bio. It's a Chinese herb. Yeah. That, okay. And I didn't say it in the full way either, but it's sort of the English, American English version is Yunin Bio. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I call it YBY because it's, <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we started him on that because the goal was to try and stop the bleeding, right? Because they weren't sure what was causing it. And they, you mm -hmm. know, it was like, you know, well, but it wouldn't. It wasn't horrible. It wasn't like, you know, just complete blood coming out, but it was definitely blood in his urine. Mm. So we had him on that for a while, and we upped the doses and stuff, stuff and stuff like that, and it didn't stop. And then in December, I'm trying to think back, in December-ish, he started, like, going off on his food and stuff. Oh. And then New Year's Eve hit, and he is not one to ever have been affected by fireworks or anything, but he was horribly. Oh. And we think it was because of just everything that his body was going through. Mm-hmm. So in January, we tried another Chinese herb to help his tummy, which was a happy stomach, I think it's called, mm -hmm. to try and help his stomach because Dr. Hale said his stomach was probably upset with all the stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. That didn't really work. He was, he was eating, but he just wasn't, he wasn't his usual basset, I'm going to eat anything no matter what you put in front of me. In February, we went for his next staging, his liver and his spleen, I think, were starting to change a little bit, and his prostate was starting to change a little bit. But they said he was still considered stable. I had done a lot of research on paroxicam. Paroxicam can affect the internal organs negatively. Paroxicam can cause your kidneys to fail if you don't pay attention to what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I made the decision at the end of February to pull him off of paroxicam. They did fine needle aspirations of his liver 
his spleen, I think, and his prostate. There wasn't cancer or anything spreading or anything. And they said, you know, well, it was probably just old age or something like that. But I just wasn't comfortable with it. So I pulled him off of it. Um, when we pulled him up, Paroxicam, his appetite came back. Aha. At his restaging three months later, his liver and his spleen started looking more normal again. Mm-hmm. So coming off Paroxicam was a good thing for him. And I tell people that. Right. It's not always the thing that every dog needs, but... In your case, that was a good strategy to take that paid off. Right. And that's what I tell them. You know, I try and tell them, you know, do your blood work right because you want to make sure that you're monitoring their blood work to make sure that if there is something going on, you catch it ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Because before I joined, some dogs were not dying because of prostate cancer, but because their kidneys were failing. Right. And it could have been because of the paroxicam. We don't know, right? But it could have been. Right. So that's one thing we're telling them now is put them on paroxicam but monitor their blood work so that if you do start seeing kidney problems or something, you can do something about it. So we pulled him up, Paroxicam. He came, he bounced back like he had never been sick. His appetite came back. He was just, he was bouncing around like a puppy again. He was great. So I was like, yes, this is what we should do. So I did my research and I put him on the that extract of turmeric, and I can't say that right either, the curcum, curcumin. Thank you, that guy. <laughs> Thank you, curcumin. That with Boswella, and it's got to be it's got to be a certain type of Boswella, and I've got that in his little book and CBD. So that was what I called my natural NSAIDs because all of those are three strong anti-inflammatories. Maybe not as strong as Paroxicam, and Dr. Hale did tell me the Paroxicam has got some kind of chemo thing in it, right? So it's got that extra little thing, but it's an anti-inflammatory. So I put him on those three. He was fine. He was eating good. He was playing with his little sister. He was just having a great time. He had another follow up in. July, and things were still stable. So I'm like, yay, that's exactly what I want. Because my goal was quality of life. It wasn't necessarily length of life. It was quality of life. Mm -hmm. So I may have been able to leave him on Paroxicam, and I might have had him a little bit longer than what I did, but his quality of life was not what I wanted it to be. Right. So he was doing really great. We went for a checkup in August. They found a small spot on one of his lungs. So we went for another checkup in September, and it was a little bit bigger. About that time, he started not wanting to eat, Mm. or he started getting picky with his eating. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. He also started being up at night. Oh. And as we went through September and into October, the not eating was getting worse, and the up all night was getting worse. Was he pacing at night? He was outside a lot. He was outside a lot at night. I have a doggy door, so he could go outside whenever he wanted, and he would just go out. He would go to bed about an hour or two hours after we went to bed. He would go outside. He would pace around for about an hour or two. He would come back inside. He'd lay down for about an hour, and he'd go back. Mm. His necropsy showed he did have some CCD. CCD is? Canine cognitive disorder. Okay, so he, he was basically having dementia was part of that. That's what I think. And uh-huh. I had questioned that, but both my vet and Dr. Hale said, there's really no way to diagnose it. You just diagnose it based on actions. And his actions weren't, except for that up at night stuff, he wasn't having other things that they said, this is definitely what was going on. That could be because one of the mushrooms that I had him on was lion's mane. And lion's mane helps with dementia. Helps with dementia. And so he was, yep. during the day, able to compensate for the dementia and sort of act normal or normal enough that you weren't noticing the cognitive failures. But at night, when he's tired and it's quiet and dark and he has no kind of reason, this is one of the things they think is that sometimes when there's no reason to act normally, people and animals will decompensate, right? And start to show that they're not doing so well. So at night, he would have a harder time. Right. Okay. So, and that's because you know that because you literally did a necropsy, which is the, what we call an animal autopsy. Correct. Okay. All right. Wow. Because I wanted to know. You wanted to know why he was up all night. Yes. Okay. Okay. You know, because what what had happened is as he, as he was starting to do that and it was starting to affect his appetite, and those two things are symptoms of advancing, cancer advancing, mm-hmm. but they're also symptoms of CCD, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you know which one's what? But we did a lot of visits with oncology for ultrasounds or x-rays 
during that time, probably about five or six of them between middle of September and end of October to try and find out what was going on because oncology would tell me his cancer, yes, it's starting to spread a little bit, but that should not be affecting his appetite. Mm. So they couldn't give me an answer on why he wasn't eating. So we were we were stopping his supplements. We were doing all kinds of stuff to try and figure out what to do to get him to eat. The problem is doing that, you take the supplements away because supplements were his only treatment for his cancer. It was allowing his cancer to progress faster. Mm. Mm-hmm. So we went through we went through October fighting the lack of appetite with no supplements, knowing that the cancer was spreading. And you didn't have like an appetite stimulant or anything else on board either? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We had multiple appetite stimulants. We had, I can't even think of everything that we had him on. One thing, believe it or not, one thing that did seem to help was acupuncture. Acupuncture seemed to help with his appetite. Yeah. And we did acupuncture for like three weeks in a row. And it was like when he would come home from acupuncture, he would be hungry. Aha. Uh-huh. That's a nice... So that helped. He was on the two different appetite stimulants. He was on a ton of stuff. None of it helped. None of it helped. That's when I got started getting real creative with some of the stuff in September with some of the stuff to try and hide the supplements in and stuff like that. And it worked. Everything would work for a little while or he would eat something for a little while and then he would change his mind and say, I don't want this. And you try something else and he'd say, yeah, I'll eat that, but then I don't want it tomorrow. That kind of stuff, right? So how much of that started off with the CCD and how much ended up because of the cancer, I can't say. But I do know that during that whole time of October that the cancer was progressing. Every time we went, it would have, it progressed a little bit more. Mm-hmm. We finally got in to see internal medicine on November 8th, I think it was, somewhere around in there. They diagnosed him with pancreatitis. So we were going to start treating him for pancreatitis on the Friday, which was the 12th, the 12th on a Friday. He went outside and his back legs were starting to knuckle under. Oh, no. And I just looked at him. I looked at him and I said, baby, you've had enough, haven't you? So I called Dr. Hale and we took him in that afternoon because he just, he gave me everything he had. And then he said, mommy, I just can't go anymore. And I was like, I am not going to try anything else. You've had enough. So it's, you know, it gets to, it it gets to the point where he gave me, he gave me 20, he gave me 20 and a half really, really good months with his cancer. And that last half a month was he wasn't doing bad, but he was doing bad those last three days. He was doing bad those last three days. And I, I, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to go in and try and, you know, I'm not going to try. And they said I could, here's where I'm going to lose it. They said we could hospitalize him and put a catheter in his neck to get food into him and do this and do that and all that kind of stuff to see if he would rebound. And I'm like, why? Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he's. We can treat the pancreatitis, but then his cancer is progressing. We can treat the cancer, but the pancreatitis is going to get him. So I just said, it's not worth it. He needs to go because he's not having the quality of life that he should have right now. And I'm not going to be able to get it back. So he left me on November 12, 2021. It's the hardest and bravest thing I think we have to do as dog lovers is to make that decision for our dogs. It is. It is. And it's hard to do, but one thing that I've learned, and I guess maybe because he did so good for so long, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't as hard as I was afraid it was going to be, if that makes sense. I know exactly what you mean. Maybe if it had been quicker, maybe it would have been harder. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. But it it wasn't. And then I learned so much, and he helped so me and our group. Our dogs are living longer now. We've got... um, Dogs in our prostate cancer group are living longer now because of some of the stuff that I found with Roscoe. We seem to be having less UTIs because of the stuff with I learned with Roscoe. We've got two or three other dogs that have done radiation only that have lived 15 months or longer. We've got dogs that are not even doing any treatment that are living a little bit longer. So I think we're finding better treatments for them just in the group. And this sounds bad, and you can cut this out if you want, as opposed to what the oncologist tells you. Does that make sense? So what I hear you saying is that the prognosis that you and your prostate cancer support group are hearing from your oncologist, from your specialists, those prognoses are not as hopeful 
as what you guys are actually getting as a group by thinking these things through and carefully applying some of the basic dietary principles and supportive practices that you've discovered with your own oncologist and general practitioner and traditional Chinese veterinary medicine practitioner, that all of these things you've learned from them and from your own research seem to be helping the dogs in your group beat their prognoses. And if that's what you're saying, I am not surprised because the prognosis, the numbers that they are using are usually based on studies where the control group is getting either no treatment or a treatment that they know they want to beat. And the successful prognosis is only getting one kind of treatment. And to my mind, and to Dr. Dressler's mind, and to the mind I think of, you know, most people, including most oncologists I know, that while one treatment will get you a powerful treatment like a radiation or a surgery, certainly, or a chemotherapy, that could take you a long way. Right. However, the other things that you do can amplify that and extend that time and certainly support the life quality. And then once a dog feels good, they want to live longer. And so they sort of have more willpower to live longer. And so I think the idea of bringing lots of treatments that in the past we would have said, well, you know, changing the diet isn't going to cure cancer. Probably true. However, what it could do is really support the body in fighting cancer harder. And it could also help that chemo or that radiation to do a better job. It could reduce their side effects so they can tolerate a higher dose of either of those, right? So when we do these, quote, extra things that don't really matter in terms of, like in the oncologist's mind, they want to kill cancer, right? That's their goal. right? And so if it doesn't kill cancer, it's not something they're thinking about. Now, this is not every oncologist. I'm making a huge generalization, and I certainly don't want any oncologist listening to think that I am denigrating them or criticizing them because I think they're (laughs) geniuses and we need them and we need more than we have. But the idea when they're giving you a prognosis, they're saying, this is what we know works with the treatments we use. They don't necessarily use all the other treatments and they don't have the hard numbers in the studies that they're looking at. They don't have those numbers available to them in a study that they can confidently offer. So I think it makes all the sense in the world that as you've been helping other people by telling them what you've learned, not just from your own research online, which I I know you've done, but you've been careful about your sources and you've really listened to people who know what they're talking about, not just anybody. (laughs) Right. And then you give it to the rest of the group and you share the good quality stuff. Hold that thought while we take a quick break to listen to our generous sponsors for today's episode. And we'll be right back with Renee and more of Roscoe's True Tale. As we talk about every week here on Dog Cancer Answers, there is a lot of advice out there for dog cancer. Everyone is always hoping for something new and fantastic. Obviously, we are too, or we wouldn't do this show. But the things that actually have benefit tend to stick around over time. They don't come and go like fads. For advice that is tried and true, has helped hundreds of thousands of dogs, for that kind of advice, you should turn to the Dog Cancer Survival Guide. The book is chock full of information about conventional treatments. It includes insights that your vet may not have time to share with you. It covers the most reliably helpful and safe supplements that you can use with your dog. Supplements that generally can be used on their own, but also with conventional treatments. The book covers diet in detail, so you can really understand how what you feed is helping your dog. And it goes over mindset and lifestyle changes that will help you and your dog with quality of life. You can get the Dog Cancer Survival Guide everywhere the books are sold, and at dogcancerbook.com. And we're back. So talk a little bit about your group and what else you're doing to promote prostate cancer awareness, because I know it's important work. Oh, yes, I'm trying so hard. Uh, So our group has grown, right? Because I, I guess because we're more active in there, 
more people when they're searching or finding it. And that's good because you get the more you get in, the more different things people are trying. You know, we've got some tried and true, but there's always something else that may be better. One of the things that we just learned about earlier this year is at UC Davis, I think it is, in a clinic in New York, they're doing a thing called embolism, where they go in and they cut off the blood supply to the tumor in the prostate. Mm. So we're, we've got one dog that just had it done a couple of months ago. So we're real interested to see how that works, right? We don't know for sure yet. There was one lady that had her dog done, and I think she said he made it for three years. But we don't know what all happened within that three years, right? Because she wasn't in the group. So now we've got somebody in the group that had their dog done while they were in the group. So we're hoping to follow that story like we did with Roscoe's story Mm -hmm. to be able to see how does that give us longer? If that's available in your area, is that something to look at that gives you longer? Because apparently it's pretty expensive, right? I would imagine. It sounds like a complicated surgery. Yeah, and I don't think they can do it on smaller dogs either because apparently they have to go in through a vein in the neck. Tiny veins. Yeah, tiny things. So it's it's something new, so we're really excited about that. So that's good. I am, and you know this, right? I'm trying to do prostate cancer awareness for dogs because the other thing that just killed me when, um, when I got into the group is the number of dogs that came into the group where they had been having UTIs or other symptoms for six months to a year, and they never diagnosed prostate cancer. And so when they got in there in our group, they only had like two or three months left. Hmm. So back in, I can't even think of my times now. (laughs) (laughs) I guess maybe a year ago Uh is when I worked with LSU and they wrote Roscoe's little story on how to diagnose prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So if your dog's got a UTI, Or if it's a female dog, if she's got a UTI, have them check for bladder cancer. Because the earlier you catch it, I don't know about bladder cancer, but I know with prostate cancer, there is no cure for it. So the sooner they catch it, the longer you're going to have with your dog and the better quality of life your dog's going to have. Right. So that's why I'm doing that. LSU did another little social media thing on their site for prostate cancer for dogs with Roscoe again. VCA vets, who is Roscoe's, one is... Roscoe's Betts is a member of the VCA. Mm -hmm. They took the excerpt from his story, two or three paragraphs that says, if you've got a UTI, this is how you diagnose it, that Dr. Kurt Ryan at LSU wrote up. And they sent it to all the VCA vets and said, let's start trying to catch this. Oh, that's wonderful. So if I bring my dog into a veterinarian who's aware of this, UTI, prostate cancer connection, what would I expect them to do with my dog who has a UTI? What are the tests they'd run to check for cancer? They would definitely do a urinalysis and urine culture. Mm -hmm. Depending upon what their urinalysis found, they would do a urine culture. Hopefully they would do the, um, I don't know the official word for it, but they'd stick the finger in and feel the prostate. Oh, sure. I think that's a prostate exam. <laughs> a prostate exam, exactly right. <laughs> yeah. um, the other thing that, that Dr. Ryan said is the other thing that they can do when they do that is they can feel the urethra and other things. So they can feel any abnormalities in that area by doing the finger check. And then depending upon what they see or feel, they will hopefully ask the owner, do you want to do an x-ray or an ultrasound if they think they might have felt something abnormal? I was just corrected by my producer. Okay. She says it's not a prostate exam. It's a rectal exam. A rectal exam. Okay, there you go. (laughs) I guess we call it a prostate exam in human medicine, so we don't have to say a rectal exam to men. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I always like to say just the finger check, right? (laughs) Right, finger check. Okay, so typically when a dog has a UTI, a physical exam is not part of it. A rectal exam is not automatic thing for a veterinarian to do. So this is kind of a new screening process for prostate cancer. Like, oh, UTI, that should trigger a rectal exam. And then if they feel anything unusual, that would trigger further imaging to see what might be going on. Right. How fabulous. It's so simple. Exactly. And the other thing that they should do, which um, when I talked to um, Dr. Gwen, Roscoe's regular vet, She said, you know, well, when she was in college, they taught them to, because Dr. Ryan said they do the rectal exam, every exam they do, period, end of story, they do a rectal exam. 
anytime a, a dog comes in. So Dr. Gwen said, well, you know, we did that. We learned that coming out of college, but we quite, kind of quit doing it, but we started it up again. Mm. So because of Roscoe, his vets has started it up again. So really what should happen is every time, every year when your dog goes in for their annual exam, male or female, they should get a rectal exam. This is so amazing. What you're telling me is that because of Roscoe and because of your dedication and attention and loving of him and your incredible care for him and your being at, you know, so close to such an amazing medical facility as LSU, they have now made a new screening method and raised awareness for veterinarians who may not have continued to do that nose to tail examination and like really remember to do the tail area as well, that that's been dropped over the years, but now your dog is going to get the finger exam. <laughs> Hopefully, right? right? That that's now should be standard of care again for annual exams. Right. Yes, hopefully it will be, right? Because just because it's been sent out doesn't mean that everybody's going to do it and it hasn't right. gone out to everybody, although I tried. <laughs> you hit it on the head. So there's two types of education that I've been trying to do. Educating the people is a little bit easier because I can get to people wider on Facebook groups and stuff like that. Educating the vets is harder, right? So I was just <laughs> thrilled when BCA, when the manager of our VCA clinic said, I will send it to all of the clinics in the VCA network. So that's all of the ones in the United States, all the ones in Canada. And I think they have some in other countries. That's a lot of veterinarians who are being reminded to do rectal exams. That's a lot of dogs that you and Roscoe have helped. That is very, very good work, Renee. And I'm going to just go ahead and thank you right now on behalf of Roscoe, but also all of the dogs that you're currently helping by helping their owners and their veterinarians and all of the dogs in the future. Because as we catch more cancer cases earlier, that gives all of us the understanding and the knowledge going forward that there are things that can be done, that we can find cancer and treat cancer. Even if we can't cure it, we can still treat it and give high quality of life. It's not an immediate death sentence. And the work you're doing, I can tell you, is impacting not just the, the people you know it's impacting, but people and dogs for decades to come. And it's really beautiful work. And I cannot thank you enough because I know how hard it is <laughs> to do what you're doing. And I, I know how much work it is. And that you're doing it out of the generosity of your own spirit tells me how much love you have in your heart and why Roscoe loved you so much. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's a sop fest today. It is. It is. <laughs> I have one more question for you, which is what's your highest and best advice for anybody who is facing dog cancer with their dog? Try not to panic because <laughs> that's, that's what you do first, right? Is you panic. Right. And I'm I'm there. The very first thing you do is panic. Yeah. And that's why I wrote Roscoe's story. I kind of think of Roscoe's story as kind of a cliff notes for your your dog cancer book, right? Because <laughs> it's kind of the same thing, only it's not as yeah. long. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it applies to one dog. Right. Exactly. It's really simple. It's like, okay, so you got this diagnosis, but you know what? There's things that you can do, right? The oncologist can't tell you change your diet. The oncologist can't tell you, go and look at these supplements that now we know help, right? The mushrooms and the CBDs and stuff like that. Go and look at the supplements. Don't go off on all the crazy supplements because the crazy stuff is probably only going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. And some of the crazy stuff may work for some cancers, but it may not work for your dog's cancer. So be really careful with the crazy stuff. Look for more the, the, more for the tried and true stuff, mm -hmm. but look at your diet, look at your supplements, that type of stuff. Get a holistic vet because they can work wonders. Mm -hmm. Get a holistic vet and have a holistic vet and you with your diet and your supplements on your dog's team with your oncologist. And that right there, and also don't be afraid to question the oncologist 
Don't be afraid to say no to chemo. Don't be afraid to say no to radiation. Each dog's different. Each cancer's different. So it may work for one dog. It may not work for yours. But think about how you want your dog to go through his cancer diagnosis. Mm. Do you want to protect his quality of life over his length of life? And if so, question him and find out how some of this stuff is going to affect his quality of life and be prepared to stop or I call it pivot if it's not working the way that you want it to work. It may shorten his life a little bit, but if it does, does he have a better quality of life and is that what you're looking for? And that's that's what I did is I, I pivoted and I stopped for Oxycam and did, didn't do chemo and stuff like that because I was looking for quality of life. And in hindsight on prostate cancer, apparently the chemo is not that key mm-hmm. so far. It doesn't tend to metastasize quickly. It's locally very aggressive, exactly. but it doesn't metastasize to distant sites quickly. Correct. And when it does, the chemo is not necessarily the most effective way to treat that either. Well, the chemo may be when it goes to the other sites, and that I'm not familiar with because I did not do chemo at all. So it's possible that, you know, when it spread to his lung or something, it's possible that we could have done some chemo and maybe that would have given him a little bit longer life. Mm -hmm. But in hindsight, looking back after we did his necropsy, he had CCD anyway. So even if I'd have put him through chemo, would it have done him any good? Right. So in his case, I guess I accidentally did exactly what was the right thing for him. Right. Whenever we lose a dog, there's no best outcome in my mind, but right. the best outcome <laughs> is that when we look back, we can look back knowing that we did what we knew to be the correct thing for our dog and that we honored our dog and our love for that dog and that we don't have regrets about that. To me, that's the highest and best outcome when it comes to dog cancer choices. Yes. And I can say, except for not being able to get into internal medicine earlier, which may not have made a difference, that I don't have any regrets at all on how I treated Roscoe. Again, it's easy to say I had him 21 months, <laughs> and he had a really good 21 months, right? So it's easy for me to say that. Mm-hmm. If if he'd have had really bad spots throughout there and all that other kind of stuff, it might have been different. The other thing that has really helped me a lot, and you probably know this, I think we've kind of messaged back and forth, is him helping so many others is kind of keeping him alive. That's right. He'll never, ever leave. Great. He'll never leave. And even if people don't know his name and they don't know why their dog is getting a rectal exam 12 years from now, (laughs) that'll be Roscoe's legacy. (laughs) Roscoe's legacy, every dog gets a (laughs) rectal Oh, that's funny. (laughs) Hey, Renee, you know, honestly, that's one of the reasons that I do this work and that everybody on the team does. We all have a a heart dog in our past or in our present who inspires us and makes us feel like, yeah, I know people out there need this information for their own heart dog, you know, that they need it now. I needed it then. And so I'm going to help because uh, like we like to say, dog lovers are a breed apart. (laughs) Yes. Yes. We want to help each other and we want to help everybody. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes, that is very true. And that was the neat thing about what, you know, once I sat back after I lost Roscoe and I started compiling all the stuff that I had done for him because I had it I had it all on notes on my phone. And then just about everything that I did for him, I had posted in our group. So I was able to go back and kind of pull it all together. Mm-hmm. And as I started looking through it, it's like, you know, most of this stuff would apply for any cancer Maybe not mast cell, right? But just about any other cancer Mm -hmm. it would apply for. And even mast cell, it's just that some of the foods, you'd have to do mast cell foods instead of these foods, right? Yep. But a lot of it's the same. Yeah. But a lot of it crosses cancers, right? It's not just prostate cancer specific. And that's when I said, whoa. So I know his document is posted in the Holistic Cancer Dog Group. And a couple of people in there have said, this is a lifesaver. You know, so um, there was one of the guys in our Basset Hound Group, his dog was diagnosed with lymphoma. So I sent it to him and he said, this is a lifesaver. So many people don't know about Mm. diet. So many people don't know about mushrooms and supplements. So many people don't know about holistic. So that's what I'm trying to do with Roscoe with just general cancer is let people know that those things are available and how to get a hold of them and how to 
how to find them. That's why I've got links to the Holistic Vet Finder in his document and all that kind of stuff. I've got links to that stuff so that they can go and find them, find somebody in their area or find somebody that does teleconferencing or something like that so that they can get that help. And that's my thing is if you can give your dog a better quality of life, maybe you can have longer with him. Right. And that's the goal. Renee, this has been such a wonderful conversation. And I so appreciate you coming on and sharing Roscoe's true tale and also all of the good work you're doing in the world. And I hope you will come back and uh, talk to us again. I'd be pleased to. Thank you so much. And thank you, listener, for joining us today. I'm sure that you are as moved as I am by Renee's love for Roscoe and Roscoe's incredible true tale. And we know that Roscoe's legacy will live on. Check the show notes for all of the resources that Renee mentioned. And make sure that you join us in Dog Cancer Support, our Facebook group. Renee is a member, and you should be too if your dog is cancer. You're going to really find a lot of like-minded and brilliant people who love their dogs as much as you do, and will have lots of warmth and support for you at this difficult time. That's dogcancersupport.com, or if you're on Facebook, you can go directly there by searching for Dog Cancer Support and then clicking our group. Also, do not hesitate to call our listener line, 808-868-3200, to tell us a little bit about your true tale or to ask a question that we can turn over to a veterinarian on a future episode of Dog Cancer Answers. Our listener line again is 808-868-3200. Thanks so much. I'm Molly Jacobson. And for all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'm wishing you and your dog a warm aloha. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcancer.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network.